Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like a sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss grace that is greater yes grace untold comes to the refuge the mighty cross grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe You that are longing to see His face Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse Again, let me welcome you to our Sabbath school. And um, we continue on our presentations that we have been on. Um, you know, based on how I number the presentations, it's 11 weeks. 11 weeks, and we are probably just about halfway through that presentation. And this week makes 11 weeks. And except for the first part of it, we haven't repeated much. But there's a common theme as we go through these presentations. That common theme, as you know, you can see throughout, is the issue of the spirit of prophecy. Testimonies that is given in these last days. This is where many challenges are in God's church, amongst God's people. And as, as, as we have to confront this issue and speak about it in a decided way, it will, we hope that it will stir the minds of everyone as so where we ought to be at this time where the councils are concerned, they are of utmost importance. It is what God's special counsel to us in these last days. And it is nothing new, just like how we preach nothing new. But it's simply expounding on what has already been written. And of course, God would tell us a few things that would have happened in our time that would not have been previously recorded. And we would have seen those things come to pass. And therefore... It is imperative that we understand truly where the councils lies, the testimonies, the spirit of prophecy in our walk with God. And we ought to make those our counsel and not what men who stand at the pulpit and preach and say to us. Whatever is said must align with the councils. If it does not align with the councils, you are obligated to reject it. If it does not align, you must reject it. It doesn't matter how genuine they appear. But if it's somebody you can reach that you are able to speak with, then you should first seek to point out the wrong. 
to show them what the council says and what is the right way. And if after many efforts you would have tried and it would have been rejected, then you are obligated to separate yourself. But you cannot because of the seeming genuineness or humility of persons that we accept what they say above what the council says. And many people fall in that, that sneer today. And we have to be extremely careful because I know that there are many, many speakers, present truth speakers, very influential men, speakers, who are out there who speak a message. And we have gone through this. We are now at the 11th week. And, um, and I hope that something would have been cleared up in our minds in relation to some of these um, controversy, which really should not be a controversy if we really should follow the council. But some of these controversies out there surrounding the testimonies and the councils that are given. All right. So um, let us begin with prayer as we get into the study today. Heavenly Father who art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your mercies and your grace, for your love, for your compassion and your long suffering towards us as we continue to make our preparation to receive you at your second coming. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we study your word, that again you will teach us and enlighten our minds as to the true issues for today that we ought to be pondering. And how we shall establish our faith in your word. Pray, Heavenly Father, that as we study, that your Holy Spirit will guide us through, even now we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. We are still on the subject of how God has our choose to reveal himself to us based on the different times and the seasons of Earth's history, based on where we are in history, based on where the church finds itself, God has chosen to reveal certain truths to his people at certain times, which he does not reveal at other times. And we know, let me just, just shift this little bit forward a little bit, just shift this forward a little bit here. Thank you. Right, just so that I can see the screen a little better. We, we know that the message that we bring, it's no ordinary message. It's the message of final warning to the world and to the church. So it's a warning message. It's a message that pleads to God's people to come out of Babylon, to come out of apostasy, and to stand in the truth and walk in the light. It is not an ordinary message, but it's a special truth that we bring. And why is it special truth? Because most have neglected this truth. They have departed from the faith. So it appears to be special, but really it should be just in the course of things as we deliver this message to the world. But to the world it is still a special truth because they speak also to the times that we're living in and that Christ soon coming is imminent. It tells us here that especially the prophecies that we would not have studied them properly in the past and so God today has called upon us again to examine these prophecies carefully that we might understand where we are. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 1, and we go all the way down to 11. It says that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And I simply just run through these at the beginning of the presentation. So when anybody comes, they don't have to go all the way back to see what we're talking about. But at the beginning of the presentation, they will get an idea of where we are and what we're talking about and that is why i every week i briefly run through these which you are very familiar with and sister white 
1901 and even before that would have counseled the church that nobody should think it a privilege to separate from the conference organization that they may show their supposed efficiency because that is entirely opposed to God's order. That was quite fine at the time. But she says here that in the future, deceptions will come into the church. And when these deceptions come, that the church would be changed and that we must look back to the 50 years between 1846 and about the time when she died for the truth upon which God established his church. And she says that deceptions will come into the church, into the Seventh-day Adventist church in particular, who was given these precious truths, and that the religion would be changed. The principles would be discarded. She says a new organization would be formed, and that our foundation, many things she wrote, new book, books of a new order would be written, and so forth, and so forth. We understand these things very well. And then here she tells us again where we should look for the truth. That the current leaders of the church, you cannot look to the current leaders of the church for truth. You cannot look to the current ministers for truth either. Where do we look for truth? To the councils. Because many today are leading God's people astray. Even the, especially the present truth ones. Now if they're in the conference, you know that until they separate themselves you have to stay a distance but those in present truth now you have to look specifically at what they present and what they teach and match it up against the councils and if god says that you should not go into the organization at this time and if somebody tells you that you should go in you know that you have to walk away from that no matter how genuine it seems So we ought to look back to the time of our pioneers for truth. And she says now with the new organization that we cannot now enter into any new organization. For this would mean apostasy from the truth. And when did she say this would happen? She said in the future when all these things, when the religion would have been changed, that that new organization that you cannot go into it because that would mean apostasy from the truth. And still today we have, and we know it's a difficult, it's, it's a struggle. But even now we still have, because of the influence of these men, when they say you should not leave but you should remain, you should go into the apostasy, many people still believe it. And if you believe that that is truth, it means you believe this is a lie. And what do you do when you're seeking for truth? You're going to seek are hold on to that which you think is true but we say let the councils be your guide let not men be your guide compare what they say with what is written be like the Bereans we cannot now enter into any new organization for this would mean apostasy from the truth she says also that in all the fallen churches and we know the fallen churches that God is doing what now? Calling his people out. And that is why she said you should not enter. If God is calling his people out, then if you're going in, that means you're going contrary to the word of God at this time. So God is calling his people out. And those who come out would mean that they would have renunciated the falsehood. It's the exact same statement written in another way. That when we come out, we would have renunciated the falsehood. If we remain in, we would not have renunciated the falsehood, but we would have accepted it. Right? There's a question? Question. Sure. Question, Greg and Barry. For, you know, we have some churches like um, they put preach present truth in their churches where they don't have do you suggest that their members should be? Because I watch YouTube videos, and uh, you know this African pastor, and he does preach a lot of present in his church, but he's just still on their conference. That's exactly why I started this way this morning. That's why I spend a few minutes to speak to that issue. 
if the if the word of God says that you should leave the apostasy and any preacher today tells you to remain or to go in is a false prophet so the Bible says you remember that you remember that um in in first or second kings they I think it's second kings when when God sent the man of when the man of God was sent to Rehoboam Jeroboam you know that pastor scripture not familiar with it I'll talk to you afterwards all right but but the word of God says that you should not go in and the pastor says the preacher is telling you to do what to say it so what do you believe you believe him or do you believe what the council says but right, that's what I tell what if he does preach everything that we preach? But what if he does preach everything that we preach? It's just that he's doing it in the building. Because he does preach everything that we preach. Right, it's not a matter that he's doing it in the building. He preaches that you should remain there. I know who you're speaking about. Right, I, I, I don't watch it, but I know who you're speaking about, right? Um, but let me let me give you... Let me give you. You remember Balaam? No. Balaam? Was it Balaam? Balaam? The prophet. Balaam? What's his name? No. What was the prophet? prophet? What was the prophet's name? Um. That tried. Was it Balaam? Balaam was his name. Yes. Balaam. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Well, Balaam was his name, right? Bela. Yeah, no, because Balaam was the king. Bela. Bela was the king. Yes. Balaam was a prophet, right? He was a prophet of God, right? Right? And he was trying to curse the, the Israel. But he could not do it because God did not permit him. But what eventually happened? He eventually, God allowed him, right? They are preaching truths and they are telling you to do certain things to remain the apostasy now many 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 persons say yes just like you yes they are preaching truth but you might not be deceived now but by beholding you become changed because he is preaching truth you will eventually believe that other things he says is truth yeah. right and you will even you will get ensnared in all of that right the the I, I have a friend who lives in Montego Bay and she worships with a group down there in Montego Bay. Uh, a gentleman that speaks present truth, right? A quotation. Um, and so you have a group of people in Montego Bay who would have come out of the conference church to be in present truth. But his message to them is that though he preaches, I'm not sure when they gather, right? But though he preaches present truth, he says to them that to come out of the apostasy is wrong, that you have to remain there. And what has happened to all of those? Every single one of them went back, has gone back into the conference church. Right? The person studied with us. And it's been a struggle. But she has enough information. And I said, invite them here. But she herself went back. But because she's with us, she's at a place where it's, 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 she's struggling to make a decision. And when I speak to her, what did she say? Not just the person who, that group that she's with, but she also references the, 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 the preacher from South Africa and others and say, how can all these men be wrong? And all of that influenced her to go back. But recently when I showed her that even the 144,000 separated themselves, caused her to think again. Um, but her mind is troubled, you know? But a greater work would done if people would would follow the truth and not follow men. They are following what men say, even though the council speaks very clearly on these issues. All right. And we know how the matter will end, right? They will join with their great apostate and form that great apostate 
of these last days. Um, you know, what I have to, to share with you today, might, I'm going to have to do it maybe in two or three parts. All right, we'll see how, how quickly we get there. All right, so this here is, well, let me, um, let me, let me, let me go back here a little bit. She talks, she says, how this, how is this matter to end? And that it will end with us being, those who would reject the truth, being a part of that great apostate of the last days. But if we go back even a little bit more, just keeping up right up here, all right? She says here, in the future, deception of every kind is to arise and we want solid ground for our feet. And what did she say here would be one of the points upon which there would be a departing from the faith. Black words right there. The, the enemy of souls will bring in false theories, yes. Such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. Right? She says in the future these things will happen. And that is what we want to look at now. Again, we want to just look at just a little bit of history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and to see how that prediction that in the future these things will come about and just trace a little bit of it for you. So we see where we are today. But I want to go to Judges first. It is, it is there. Judges chapter 2. And we're at verse 7. I'm going to read verse 8 as well. And then we read 10 to 12. Because the Bible tells us that that which is written is written as an example for us in these last days. And in Judges chapter 2 it says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. But not just Joshua. And all the days of the elders that outlived who? Joshua. So they served the Lord during the days of Joshua. And during the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. In other words, they were working with Joshua. So they, they, they understood the truth as Joshua understood it. And they walked with him. So during the life of Joshua and the elders that served with Joshua... They serve the Lord. Who are those elders who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel? Alright? Good. Verse 8 now says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And in verse 10 to 12 now it says, And also, now watch, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel so when it says that and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers who was that talking about? the, the, elders. the elders that served with Joshua so Joshua died right? Joshua died and when Joshua died, you had the generation that were gathered, that were the, the, all that generation were gathered unto their father. Then it says, and there, also, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor, what, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So the generation that knew the works that God had done for Israel, they passed. Right, and another generation arose. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. That's why I was, it got me confused there with Balaam. That's right. All right, and served Balaam. No, verse 12 says, And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. Of the gods of the people that were round about them. So who, where did they find all these gods that they served? The people who were round about them. And bowed themselves unto them 
and provoked the Lord to anger. All right. What happened in our time? What happened in our time? Sister White, we know, retirement years died in 2015. 1915. 1915. <laughs> died in 1915. Very good. You know, I was. I remember I was. I was in 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 school, and the lecturer made an error deliberately to see if we would pick it up. This was not deliberate. <laughs> but when when it was picked up, he said, "Ah, okay, good. I know you're listening. There you go. All right. So Sister White died in 1915, July 16 to be exact. All right." And now we are comparing Sister White with who? With Joshua. Because Joshua died, and a generation after that, the church went into apostasy. All right? But, you know, before I go here, but it was not just Joshua that died. But who else that died also? The elders. The elders died. Those who knew what the Lord had done for Israel. The apostasy that took place a generation after Sister White died, none of the pioneers were alive. Yes. You can, you can simply just check the internet. Just type it in. And you will see that all the pioneers died before. When I checked it, the one that was listed died in 1944. But you can check that, all right? But they all they all died, and if you go back to to from the time of our pioneers from the 1850s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 1955 onwards, it was 90, 100 years on. So they all had passed. So the apostasy came into the church not just a generation after Sister White died. But also when all the pioneers would have also passed, all the elders that served and worked with her would have passed also. And the apostasy started to come into the church at that time in about 1955. That is what we have written here. Seventh-day Adventist answers questions and doctrines. I know you know this. Yes. Sure. No, so you weren't you didn't want to stand up? No, pioneers were alive. She died in 1915. 1915. So a lot of the pioneers were alive then. I believe they made a mistake. You will find mistakes in the in the writings of the pioneers and so forth. So you're uh, saying that it wasn't on the Sabbath that she was buried? They had three services. The yeah. last one was on the Sabbath, yes. Right. All right. So, so here we want to look at what happened here. We're gonna try to go through it very quickly, but there are some things I want to point out as we go through questions and, and answers and doctrines. Seventh Day Adventist seeks to provide these answers. All right, and this was commissioned by the general conference at the time All right. it says perhaps no other book has aroused so much controversy in the history of the seventh day adventist church as the 1957 publication involving walter martin and and barnhouse those were the evangelicals evangelicals and evangelical side and a number of general conference leaders on the adventist side all right. So, question on doctrines was to be the apology par excellence. It means that it was supposed to be the the book that the, the, the primary book, the, the the best book that provide all the answers in apologizing for the doctrines of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. So, when you read this, you're supposed to understand essentially that our doctrines are wrong it's really what it is saying yeah. it was an apology for our doctrines but it was the, the book that's supposed to set those things straight so that no man would question it the apology par 
excellence. All right. So let's keep this one and move on. It says, although the book received a de facto imprimatur from the general conference. In other words, they got the permission from the general conference to publish the book. Even though the general conference, in, in, in the eyes of the general conference, it wasn't an official document necessarily to represent the church. But they got the permission. It was the general conference who, who asked them to go into these conferences with these men. And they got the permission from the general conference to publish the book. But not necessarily that it represented all the views of those of the of the conference. It says now it generated a passion, passionate dissent concerning the book's treatment of Christ's human nature and what? And the atonement. Now remember that Sister White says that one of the doctrines that would be discarded would be the doctrine of the sanctuary. The atonement here is the doctrine of the sanctuary. And one generation after she died, she said in the future things will happen, right? One generation after she died, 40 years after she died, the doctrine of the sanctuary came into question at the general conference level of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a single generation after. Just like the Bible said it happens at the time of Joshua and after all the pioneers would have passed. It says, single-handedly spearheading this protest was M.L. Andreessen. And we thank God for M.L. Andreessen. A retired theologian determined to have questioned and doctrine censored and withdrawn. Andreessen campaigned against it, denouncing it as the most subtle and dangerous error and the most dangerous heresy. And you will see that what happened there has carried all the way down through to our time today. And this is ML Andreessen working to have that book censured and withdrawn. So he had to write letters to the churches refuting what was happening and pointing out the errors that they had put together in that question, Adventist questions and answers and doctrine. Doctrines and answers. All right, it says here, according to the White Minutes, they had a meeting in 1957. Two men, members of the committee, had been appointed to write the book that came down to, know, to be known as Questions and Doctrine. And they were invited by the board. What is the board? That's the general conference. To meet with them to discuss a question that had received some consideration at a meeting the previous January. It concerns statement made by Mrs. White in regard to what? The atonement. Comes up again. Sister White says that doctrine would be discarded. And it was a, one of the doctrines that was in discussion here. When the apostasy in the church, a generation after she died, started. Atonement now in progress in the sanctuary above. This conception did not agree with the conclusions reached by the leaders of the denomination in council with the evangelicals. This conception did not agree with the conclusions reached by the leaders of the denomination in council with the evangelicals. So those who had councils with the evangelicals, when they concluded, they agreed with the evangelicals that there was problems with the doctrine and the sanctuary. And they were bringing that concept into the church. All right? Good. Come now. It says here, I just want to read it through just so we get a picture of what was happening. Because they were they were colluding with those evangelicals. And what the Bible says that by beholding again we become changed. And as they colluded with the evangelicals, and the evangelicals can be very charismatic. And as they went into agreement with them, into discussion with them, parlaying with them, they became changed and they accepted the doctrines that they came with. You know, um, 
in in late 2019 early 2020 we had a we had a um some preachers from overseas came here and we we had some meetings here and one of those one of those gentlemen spoke with me he called me and he spoke with me one on one and as he spoke with me he was telling me about the feast days how that he had some conversation with some evangelicals and they were questioning him about the feast days essentially that they were saying that the feast days should still be kept today right and he said as he spoke to them he could not find an answer to refute what they were saying so because he could not refute what they were saying in his mind he joined them yes he agreed with them so now he was keeping the feast days the seventh day adventists and as a result of that they used the feast days to make certain predictions and you know what happened to those predictions they all went out the door right and they received some backlash as a result of it but those predictions that were made in relation to the mark of the beast coming at a particular time back in 2019 it was based on those feast days based on their own words and then he brought that to the other preachers who was in the circle and they all accepted it coming from the evangelicals why because they could not refute what they were saying in their minds they could not do it so what they do they, do, they simply accept it same thing that happens here so the Adventist leader had for some time been in contact with two ministers of another faith, evangelicals, Dr. Barnhouse and Mr. Martin, respectively editor and assistant, and an assistant editor of the religious journal Eternity, published in Philadelphia and discussed with them various, various of our doctrines. In these conversations, as in the numerous letters that passed between them, the evangelicals had read serious objections to some of our beliefs, Adventist beliefs. All right, let's go very quickly. The question of greatest importance was whether Adventists could be considered Christian while holding, watch this now, while holding such views as what? The doctrine of what? The sanctuary. The 2,300 days. The date 1844. The investigative judgment. All of that has to do with the sanctuary. All of it has to do with the sanctuary message that sister white says would be discarded and christ's atoning work in the sanctuary in heaven since 1844 all of that had to do with the sanctuary message that if we can if we could be considered christians by holding essentially onto the sanctuary message that was their issue one of their issues. Our men expressed the desire that the Adventist church be reckoned as one of the regular Protestant churches. A Christian church, not a sect. Hold a second, you know. So, eh? <laughs> yeah. We are asking them to reckon us as one of you. Basically, that's what it really says. Right? <clears throat> And Sister White says again, I repeated this, that the enemy will bring in false theories such as that the doctrine of the sanctuary, that there is no sanctuary. All right. It, it continues here. The two groups spent hundreds of hours studying and writing many pages, Mr. Andreas says. The evangelical visit our headquarters in Takahoma Park and our men what, visited Philadelphia and were guests to Dr. Barnos in what now? In his comfortable home. You see comfortable home. From time to time other men were called into consultation on such matters as the voice of prophecy and our periodicals all with a view of asserting what stood in the way of our being recognized as a Christian denomination. What stood in the way? The sanctuary. The sanctuary. That was one of the key doctrines that stood in the, stood in the way. Alright, very good. So we're following very well. Alright. After long and protracted discussion, the two parties came at last to a working agreement and thought the evangelicals still and though the evangelicals still objected to a number of our doctrines, they were willing to recognize us as Christians. 
what did they say now we would need to make some changes so I say religion would be changed we would need to make some changes in some of our books books of a new order would be written in regard to the mark of the beast and also regarding the nature of Christ while in the sanctuary in the <laughs> in the flesh I don't know if this cue is right in the flesh so they did not get all that they wanted right but they agreed that they would work some more they will accept these and continue the work to change the faith the religion the doctrines the church so what happened now because we're talking about the sanctuary here so there was a prominent person in the adventist church that championed the whole idea that the sanctuary should be is an is an error the doctrine as we understand it is error and that it should be changed who was that person desmond, desmond ford all right good now so let's look at what happened with desmond ford now what i'm about to read to you is taken from the seventh day adventist encyclopedia the sda encyclopedia right it's right there and um and in the encyclopedia of the Seventh-day Adventists, they have what transpired with Dr. Ford documented. There for all of us to read. So let's, let's begin here now and see what happens. Because remember now, the work that was started on questions and doctrines did not end. They said that they would accept what they could achieve then, but then the work continues. Emma Langer says similar steps would be taken. And not long after we have this, and I, these are just the prominent ones. It says here, an historic and controversial theological consultation, the Sanctuary Review Committee involved approximately, what now? 115 international Bible scholars and church administrators. What committee was that? The Sanctuary Review Committee. So you have to understand that when God speaks, he speaks because he knows certain things are going to come to the fore. And he said one of the doctrines, specifically through his messenger, that this doctrine here, this doctrine of the sanctuary, is going to be one of the points that will be discarded in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. One of the doctrines that would be discarded. And so much so, that they had to establish a sanctuary review committee consisting of 115 international Bible scholars and church administrators who convened at what? Glacier View Ranch. And they gave where? On August 10, 15, 1980. Right? The unprecedented gathering was tasked with evaluating non-traditional interpretation of the church's sanctuary doctrine, which had caused widespread ferment when publicly expressed nine months previously by Australian theologian Desmond Ford. The doctrine of the sanctuary came in for scrutiny. It says here, here, former Adventist Review editor Raymond Cottrell described the meeting as the most important event of this nature in Adventist history since when? Since the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis. This was in 1980. No, not this. The, the, the conference of the Sanctuary Review Committee with Dr. Ford took place in 1980. And Raymond Cottrell, who was former Adventist Review editor, said that, the, that this meeting that took place in 1980 with Deadman Ford could be considered the most important event of this nature in Adventist history since, 80, since the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis. Richard Hamill, former president of Andrews University and coordinator of the consultation, considered the meetings to have constituted what? The most earnest endeavor and the greatest investment of funds 
in the time of Adventist workers from all parts of the world field that had ever been given to the discussion of a doctrinal problem in the Adventist church. In other words, they have never had to address a doctrinal issue in the Adventist church as great a problem as the doctrine of the sanctuary. That's how that meeting in 1980 with Dr. With Desmond Ford was described by persons who were very familiar with that situation and who were probably in the meeting. It says here, speaking now to what happened with Dr. Ford, the immediate context for the convening of the Center Review Committee, SRC, was a public presentation by Dr. Ford. That's what triggered it. At a local chapter meeting of the Association of Adventist Forums at Pacific Union College on October 27, 1979. So roughly a year after they had that meeting. But what happened? The thing spread widely very quickly. That presentation that he made. Ford had addressed the topic of what? The investigative judgment. That's a sanctuary message. That was the, the issue of, of Ford. Uh, come now. It says now, Ford's presentation began with citations from Ellen White. Sounds familiar? He, and that is where the great deception comes in, in today. They don't reject Sister White outright. And they don't come and tell you that she's not a prophet and we shouldn't listen to her. They themselves quote her. Same thing happened today. Kellogg quoted her in his book, Living Temple which was nature worship the book was, and he quoted her to justify his nature worship so doc, dr ford is a doctor desmond ford quoted sister white in trying to justify his position and that she encouraged theological inquiry and investigation he then briefly rehearsed the story of a problems in daniel committee so it, it, it dated back before, but this is when it really came to the fore. A problems in Daniel committee, 1960 to 1966. So what is happening here is that all of this was a continuation of what happened in 1955 with the questions and doctrine. So before Desmond Ford, there was also this committee that came up that had problem. What what kind of problems do they have with Daniel? That they have to form a committee to examine the book of Daniel, really? And that took place, that those committees existed between 1960 and 1966. And again, that committee was appointed by the General Conference. And that committee said had endeavored unsuccessfully to find solutions to contextual and exegetical problems related to the churches central sanctuary teaching so what was that committee about again looking at the doctrine of the sanctuary and the general conference again appointed a committee to examine this issue of the sanctuary that started roughly a generation after sister white died and he also cited other information in trying to come to his justification of his Position, yes. Yes, you are seeing that they did have a problem, but what was the problem they had with the sanctuary message? The, 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 the problem was the doctrine as we understand it today that Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place in 1844, October 22nd, and that a period of investigative judgment began. So, what was your belief then? That didn't. That, that did, right. Brother Gray is going to chip in. But one of the things is that they say that atonement was done at the cross. Oh, so Adventists believe that? Some of them held that position. Brother Gray. Well, the evangelical world believe that. And therefore, they were saying that Adventists were cult for believing that in 1844 that Christ moved from the holy to the most holy. Because in their view, and that is why it's so dangerous what we study some time back, so read these different translations because some of the translations in AD 31 they put Jesus into the most holy place but we don't believe that as some Adventists that is what separates some Adventism from Evangelicals 
because evangelicals believe that when Christ ascended, that he went straight in to the most holy place. But as Adventists, we believe that he went to the holy, and then 1844, he moved to the most holy. So they came up with the view that some of the Adventists came up with this story to, sh to hide shame to their face, because we came up with the story that in 1844, that Christ moved from one apartment to the next. And they're called us a cult because we believe in the sanctuary doctrine. So Adventists then shift gears to be accepted by the, ev the evangelical world so that they won't look like us, so they then try to force away or the doctrine, get away from the doctrine of the sanctuary. Oh. Right, thank you, thank you, Brother Grace. So, so what you're seeing, is, seeing here is that a central part of the controversy within the church and the evangelicals and the changes that they wanted to make in the Seventh-day Adventist Church was in relation to the doctrine of the sanctuary. So that was the heart of it. Adventists themselves didn't have a problem, but they wanted to be accepted by the society. And in order to do that, they end up changing themselves. Some did not have a problem, but some also had a problem from before. From before. Yes, some had a problem. So when, 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 when Desmond Ford came out, then they, they speak out, as you will see. Okay. They now express that this was my view also. But they just did not speak out because they feared backlash. Okay. But they got empowered now as Desmond Ford speak out. Then they started to also speak out as well. All right. So, so the sanctuary was a central message to, and 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 the spirit accurately identified this message through his through, through the messenger of the Lord that this would be a central issue in the apostasy of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It says now, Ford then proceeded to delineate the specific problems that he had with it, such as the scriptural basis for the year, the principles. So these are some of some specific issues that, 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 that he also had issues which, which relates to the interpretation of the prophecy of Daniel 8. All right, let's go down to the, to the blue words. It says, because of these problems, Ford asserted the doctrine of the sanctuary as traditionally held by Adventists could not be supported directly or solely by scripture. Now remember that when he started out, what did, he, what did we read first that he did? He quoted Sister White, right? But then here now he says that the problems that he asserted in relation to the doctrine of the sanctuary as traditionally held then by the church and us today that it cannot be supported directly or solely by the scripture. Now we know that is false because Brother Greaves came and he went through the sanctuary message and proved it from scripture alone and history. Right? We, we have done that many times. So this is patently false. We know that. Alright, so watch this now. He supported his supposed solution with recent citation from who now? From Adventist authors and with Ellen White quotation. See, they quote Sister White again. According to us, UGT, he heard the presentation for did presentation for did not throw out the spirit of prophecy, he says. But did raise questions about the nature of its authority. Alright. I want you to notice something that's happening here. Because again, it's the same thing that happens in our time. They don't throw out the spirit of prophecy, but what they do, they question the authority of the spirit of prophecy. That's what happened in the church today, in 2015. That's what happened. They don't throw it out, but they question the authority, and that is why the change is made in the doctrine, the authority of her, her writings is removed. That it is not a continuing authority. When did they end it? So they questioned the authority. Said he did not throw it out, but he simply questioned the nature of her authority in the establishment and validation of doctrine. He said, what authority does she have to establish and validate doctrine? 
That's essentially what they said. At the same time, insisting that Ellen White's role was absolutely indispensable. Now, that does not make any sense. It's confusion. They question her authority, but then say she is indispensable. Mm -hmm. To the development and survival of the Advent movement. So the deception that they have there is no, we accept her, but you don't have to listen to her. And the things that you disagree with her, go ahead, disagree. It is fine. If she says something that you agree with, that is good also. You just don't have to be bound by anything that she says. Just like we are not bound by anything that she writes in relation to the sanctuary. We have our own positions. We see things through our own eyes. Is what they were saying. And again, that is what we see happen here. As they question the authority of Sister White. We would have gone through this already. Dr. Manuel Rodriguez says that Sister White can enrich but not define our faith and practice. And in 2015, they voted this change in 2015. And see here, the issue of her authority is removed from the new statement and doctrine. It's removed. They simply say she can tell some things that's happening in the future. She has a prophetic gift. But she has no authority in how we practice our faith. You can do as you please. Just try and reference it in the Bible. But the Bible tells us that these counsels will be given to us. Hear what it says now. This is come to your question now. It says, in his response to Ford, this is Eric Syme. He was one of the persons at Pacific Union College that facilitated the presentation. In response to Ford, Eric Syme, professor of religion and history at PUC, stated that he disagreed with him on only a few extremely minor points that he would not take time to raise. So he basically agreed with everything that he said except some minor points that he's not going to waste his time on. As most of my students will certainly confirm, he pointed out, so much that Dr. Ford has said in this very eloquent and very lucid presentation, I have been teaching myself. So what he's saying is that what Dr. Ford presents, he has been teaching it to his students. And what is that? The doctrine and the sanctuary as we understand it is wrong. That's what he said he was teaching his student as a professor of religion at PUC. But they would not speak openly about it. And he said his students can testify as to what he teaches. That it is in line with that, what Dr. Ford presented. So he was, he was saying, listen, I have witnesses that what I say is true. False witnesses that testifies to a false position. And that is why the Bible says that when you, by beholding, you become changed. And when you listen to the errors, you are going to end up agreeing with the errors. If you do not pull yourself away from it. So, so you see, they are coming out. I look at this one. In particular, Sime was glad that Ford had emphasized the need to avoid what did he emphasize? The need to avoid giving Ellen White canonical authority. He was glad he did that. That's why they questioned her authority. A theme that later occupied more than half of the questions in the question and answer portion of the presentation. So what are we seeing here? The issue was about the testimonies, essentially. And what is contained in the testimonies. That was the issue. Same as is today. The issue is about the testimonies. Whether we accept or reject them. But God gave those special testimonies to us. To guide us. That's why I say to you. That. I don't want anybody to say. Brother Barrett say. And I'm sure Brother Graves would say the same. And anybody else who speaks 
Don't say we say, quote the testimonies. Because if we quote the testimonies, we would not say the, 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 the preacher from South Africa say. You have to go to the testimony and say, the testimony says this. Understanding the times and the seasons that God chose to reveal truths to his people. And the thing is that when you, when you accept and follow the, the, the teachings of God, God will reveal more light. When you reject it, you're going to be stuck in darkness. It's not going to go any higher. In particular, he was glad that, he, that, that Ford avoid giving Ellen White canonical authority. A theme that later occupied, oh we read that all the, more than half the questions that was that, that happened there. Alright, I won't read the, the those, those words there at the bottom but let's continue here. When Ford's, another person now, when Ford's mentor, he now was retired, a retired seminary professor, Edward Hempestal, heard a tape recording of the meeting. He wrote a letter of encouragement affirming, you express my convictions right down the line. So you see, there are many who felt that way today. But they would not speak. Now, he would have been retired already. But he was bold enough now to speak when Ford made his presentation. He was emboldened. And that everything was right down the line of his own personal convictions. Although he worried that some negative reactions might come concerning what Ford had said about the inspiration of Ellen White. And again, you see how the testimonies become a part of the big conversation at the time as it is today. What time is it? 11.44. I'm going to stop right here. I will not go further. Because if I enter further, I have to finish it. And then Brother Grace would not get to speak. So I, I have to pause... <laughs> I have to pause right here and um and and we'll have to we'll have to continue um next week as we as we come down to the to the rest of it down to down to our time here and show how the issue the doctrine of the sanctuary continues to be a problem right through the church until our time And just like how when they were discussing the issue of the sanctuary and they eventually rejected it, well, those today are, when they rejected it and questioned the authority of Sister White, those today who question the authority of Sister White, it's also a rejection of the sanctuary message. Because all the testimonies, the foundation of the testimonies is the sanctuary message. And if you're discarded with Sister White writing the testimony, the spirit of prophecy, it means that you would have rejected the message of the sanctuary. And that is the foundation of it. It comes right down through. And that is why the Holy Spirit, through the pen of inspiration, identified that specific doctrine and said, this will be a problem in the church. It is gonna be discarded. Yeah, um, Pastor, Pastor has his hand up at the back. So I said that they straight testimony will seek the church. Straight testimony will seek the church. Indeed. If we reject the testimony, the church cannot be sifted. So they win until everybody will mix up. And that will be a problem. If we reject the sanctuary doctrine, we reject Adventism. Full stop. Christendom has never accepted the investigative judgment or the sanctuary. Correct. That is what was bequeathed to us. And if we fail to preach that, believe that, and live that, we are not accepting this. Indeed. And, and for them to accept the sanctuary message, they have to accept 1844. Correct. It was an experience. Something that had was experienced 
and they would have to accept 1844. Um, all right, so um, we continue next week as we continue down the line looking at, at, at this specific issue of the sanctuary as it is rejected through the ages, right after 40 years, a generation after Sister White's passing and after all the pioneers would have died, that this apostasy, this rejection of this particular doctrine came into the church and it continues right through to the end, to the stage where we are today. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we again want to thank you for these few words that we would have studied, looking at the events surrounding what you would have told us will happen in your church, how even that the message, this key message, this foundational message would be rejected. We know, Heavenly Father, if the foundation be destroyed, the building will crumble with it. And so, Lord, we pray that even now, that we will establish and continue to build on this solid, this sure foundation of prophecy, Jesus being, Heavenly Father, the chief cornerstone that holds it together. Pray that your word and your people will continue to be blessed and that having learned these things that we will be in a position to explain it to others. It's not for us, Heavenly Father, just to hear, but it's for us to internalize, to write these things upon the heart and that we might be able to speak a word in time and in season to give a reason and a justification for our faith. Be with us now and the rest of today's program we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great Father, our great monarch of heaven, we come to you one more time, giving you thanks again for your mercies, your grace, and your love for journeying with us and for opening our minds and our understanding to your truth. We ask you, oh God, that you'll help us, Lord, to stand firm and that we'll be able to tell what we believe and why we believe what we believe. As we enter now into this session, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come down and teach us your will as we open our hearts to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I quote again from Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. And every time I read, I reflect. God did not say, get thee out of the land and go to X place. No, he said, go unto a land that I will show you. He didn't tell him where he was going. So, brethren, when God speaks, may we listen. I'm going to read something from this wonderful book of healing, In Contact with Nature. The Creator chose our first parents, the surroundings best for their health and happiness. So if God chooses it, no matter if you don't like it, it's best for us. Sometimes we do our choosing. And like in the first part, it's good. And we tell our friends, I've chosen a place and this is a place I'm going to live and I like this place. It's flourishing, it's fertile. And, and then after a time, something happens. We get sick and family members die. And a lot of things happen. Not saying that if God chooses a place, those things won't happen enough, you know, because they will happen for a test. But a test is different from what's the word? 
from discipline. That's the word I want to find. He did not place them in a palace or surround them with the artificial adornments and luxuries that so many today are struggling to obtain. And it's a struggle too. People are borrowing and all kinds of things just to get what my neighbor has because I like that and I want that. So I'm going to take it out and hire purchase and I'm going to take it out on three months and six months and something happens down the line with the paycheck and they have to be calling us and calling and calling and disaster. So let us be satisfied with what God gives us. Amen. He placed them in close touch with nature and in close communion with the holy ones of heaven. And some of us who went to St. Elizabeth last week can attest to that experience. Pastor, you missed out on it. <laughs> but I know you know the place. It was so serene. It was so humble. It was nice. I wanted to stay. In the garden that God prepared as a home for his children, graceful shrubs and delicate flowers greeted the eye of at every turn. There were trees of every variety, many of them laden with fragrant and delicious fruit. Where do you think they get the perfume from? From the flowers. The same flowers that God grows. On their branches, the birds carol their songs of praise. Under their shadow, the creators of the earth or the creatures of the earth sported together without fear. You ever see a bird on the ground and you walk up to it and it flies? That didn't happen, you know. They could touch them, they could eat from their hands. We are gonna go back to it. Amen. Let us try for those times. It's not easy for us now. And as the studies goes on, we are going to be meeting up on a lot of people and we have to stand up for what we believe in. We can't just fall prey to everything and just join them. We are in truth. Let us hold on to truth. And I'm speaking to myself because we might not understand everything that is being presented here, but we have the, stu the book studies. We can get the books for ourselves. And when we pray and ask God and fast, he will teach us little by little, day by day. Because some of us are not fast learners, but we will learn if we are willing to, if we open our hearts. So God is calling us to learn, to sit at his feet this morning. It says that Adam and Eve, in their untainted purity, delighted in the sights and sounds of Eden. God appointed them their work in the garden to dress it and to keep it. What an honor. The creator of this world, he made it, he called it into being. being, And he, he, he bent below and he created man. And he went down and he breathed into man and he gave us... Oh, the breath of life and said just this garden it is yours God had the opportunity to name the animals you know I feel when my children are born and I get the opportunity to name them God gave Adam the opportunity to name the creatures but guess what they didn't listen and like some of us we don't listen we want to hear what we want to hear when we want to hear it and do it how we want to do it when we want to do it but god is appealing to us today to do his will it says here that we are to keep the children from the hotbeds of iniquity and so often we are hearing about the children the children the children the children yes they are prone to all kinds of evil in this world I have a friend whose daughter was attending a public school and she prayed and she fasted and she prayed and she fasted and she school was reopened in, in, in January and the child went on to school and she prayed and she fasted and lo and behold she got a call from Safe to Serve, Serve Academy and it cost her much more but that's where her daughter is because she tells herself she doesn't want her child to continue in 
apostasy in those educational systems. So it says here that we are to keep the children from the hotbeds of iniquity. Let no temporal advantages tempt parents to neglect the training of their children. So many of us are guilty. Whenever possible, it is the duty of parents to make homes in the country for their children. The children and youth should be carefully guarded, not left alone to their own demise, to do whatever they please and say whatever they please and keep company with whomever they want. It doesn't matter if people say you behave like your children better than theirs. That's a plan of the enemy to allow you to let your children go to their homes and they come to their homes and sleep. And Sister White says we should not allow our children, especially our boys, to sleep in the same, sleep in the same bed with other boys. They shouldn't even be sleeping over, right? Let alone to be sleeping in the same bed. And some of them are not really um, believers. They met them at school and mommy this is my friend and they meet the mother oh nice boy you have nice girl you work at this place and that place can my son come over and oh yes they come over and they have weekend sleepovers in the and you don't know what's happening under the covers you don't know what happens when the lights are off so we have to guard our children we have to safeguard them it's our duty to safeguard them the children they said they should be kept away from the hotbeds of iniquity that are to be found in our cities. Let them be surrounded by the influences of a true home, a home where Christ abide. And how is Christ going to abide in that home if there's no praying, if there's no reading of the word, if there's always scolding? Sister Wise, I almost scold our children. When I first read that, I had to look up the meaning. And she says, we must, and we must talk to them lovely. No matter what they do, ensure that when you're um, chastising them, the words that come out are not so profound to them that they turn away from instructions. It should be um, whatever the child na child's name is, and you call their name nicely and you um, introduce them to the word of God or you say to them, mommy and daddy wouldn't like that or, you know, you talk to them nice and, and, and I think I am guilty too because when they get angry it's hard for you to be <laughs> you just want to push it out but the word of God wouldn't want the word, the Lord wouldn't want us to do such things, we are always to be nice and kind and our words are to be seasoned with grace and you know all of that, so it, practice becomes a habit, right? Mm -hmm. it says <clears throat> let children no longer be exposed to the temptations of the cities that are ripe for destruction the Lord has sent us warning and counsel to get out of the cities then let us make no more investments in the cities fathers and mothers how do you regard the souls of your children may god help us we need to be on our knees if it's even one child you have sister grieves i have four of them go down and call your names call them to jesus tell jesus you want them to be saved in your kingdom in his kingdom so that you all can be greeted on that day of reckoning are you preparing the members of your families for translation in the heavenly courts? Are you preparing them to become members of the royal family? Children of the heavenly king? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? How will ease, comfort, convenience compare with the value of the souls of your children? Let us take heed, brethren. God is calling us. We have a work to do in the cities, but he wants us to go into the countries. How nice it would be to step out in the morning and pick something and eat from what you have planted. And you go in the field and you dig up some yam and some potato. You cut some kalaloo and some pak choy and you put it with some peas and some beans and that's what God wants us to eat. And some aki. <laughs> 
thank God that he has provided enough for us to eat. Amen. We can depend on him always. So let us earnestly continue to pray and fast that God will lead his children. All of us won't be in the same place. Mm -hmm. So we are here learning. So we can tell it to every kindred and nation what we have been taught. So we can learn how to make the flu bomb sister Janelle and learn how to make the poultice for the little cuts and all of those things, the, the, the blood thinner and how to learn how to clot the blood. Yes, all of that. This morning when I was waiting, I walked out in the sunshine on the street. There's like a crossroad where we live and I was watching our dog. She was eating grass. And I said, look at that. She knows when to go for her medicine, but some of us don't. And even if we don't, we want it. We don't want to take them because they don't taste nice. Right. But instead of getting sick, let us eat and drink what is required of us. We need to go out in the country to breathe the fresh air and to be healthier because the city is polluted and it makes us sick. Even us where we are, we get sick because it's so polluted. So let us continue to pray. Okay, brethren? I'm going to sing a verse of my favorite song, one of my favorite songs, and I ask you to join me if you know it. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Do not detain me, for I am going to where the fountains are ever flowing. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. We're pilgrims, we don't belong here. Amen. Let us pray. Most righteous, loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your love. A love that we cannot understand, but a love that won't let us go. Amen. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. We thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, that you know the end from the beginning and you always prepare for us. So we ask you, Lord, to help us to stand by your side, to sit at your feet and learn from you. Wherever we have gone wrong, whatever we have said wrong, whatever we have thought wrong, we ask you to forgive us. And Lord, we ask you to help us to forgive those who have wronged us. Because Lord, we cannot live in eternal peace if we cannot forgive. We pray this morning or this afternoon that you'll continue to lead and direct our lives as we prepare to go into the countryside to live and to learn more of you and to, to find others to witness to. We pray, Jesus, that we will listen, open our ears and listen and obey. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for this family. And may we all be united that the Holy Spirit will descend and engulf this place. Hear us now. Bless us and continue with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.